Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. And we have got a lot to discuss today. We've got a special guest already on the line, but we'll bring him in here momentarily. It is Friday, July 17th. It's the end of the week. We finally made it. <laughs> Thank Jesus. All right. So the website, of course, winningcureseverything.com. Make sure you go over and check it out. All of our picks, previews, podcasts, videos, social media platforms are all over there. If you are watching the show live right now, you can jump in on Periscope, Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube Monday through Friday, every single week, you can jump in to the chat. It's right there in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and it doesn't matter which platform you are on. It will populate right there. You can help drive the conversation with us at your pleasure. Whatever you would like, whatever time you want to hop in, just go ahead and do it. So go check that out. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast. If you miss, or if you miss a live show, uh, you can just jump in on the podcast. It's very easy. It's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcast app is. Leave a nice five-star review. That helps us out a ton more than you know. So let's go ahead and get this thing rolling. We will talk to our special guest here. We've got Mr. TJ Reeves. He is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers sideline reporter, the host of the Three Dog Thursday podcast. You can get him on Twitter, at Buck Sideline Guy. TJ, how are you, my friend? So it's always great to be with my winning cures, everything, dudes. Happy Friday. How you feeling, boys? <laughs> we are so glad we made it. It's been a long week. <laughs> no doubt on a lot of fronts. Well, I don't know about you. Uh, I know in the Mid-South from having lived there, from having gone to school there, it is hot everywhere in the South this time of year. Here today, it has been 106 with the heat index. Ooh. And you're talking to someone that spent most of the morning, and Chris can identify with the manual labor uh, most of the time. I, I spent most of the morning helping my father pressure wash an RV after his a uh, 10-day trip with my mother. Uh, no thank you on doing that in the dead heat of the day. At least we did it in the morning, and I am I am feeling every bit my uh, my half century of existence, my 50 years. I don't know if you guys knew that I'm that old of a fart, but I am feeling every bit of it right now, boys. But I, uh, with you. I did not know that you were that old. I will say that. You, uh, you seem like a much younger man. He so, says it so delicately. Thank you. Well, it's appropriate that you say that I. it seems like or I look like a younger guy because I feel like an older guy right now. I feel older than 50, hey, so that's I, a good balance out. I yeah. will admit that. Uh, look, you know, I'm 37 uh, with a 2-year-old at home and a 14-year-old. Oh I, I feel God. closer to your age than uh, than my own. So it's <sighs> it's pretty nuts. Uh, Michael jumps in on Twitch, by the way. He said, what's up, fellas? Happy Friday. Of course, uh, everybody that wants to jump in on the chat, again, bottom left-hand corner of your screen, it will populate right there. Everybody can be involved in the conversation. So, TJ, the big news, everybody hyped it up. Everybody talked about it. Um, and then it just kind of appeared, and it, it, we'll discuss it. Let's go ahead and, and dive into it. The Washington NFL team, I can't say Redskins anymore, but, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's officially not that. But it, the news came out, the Washington Post, and everybody been hyping this up basically since the weekend, and it finally broke yesterday. And it this is why rumors really suck, to, to put it bluntly, is you hear all of these things. The Athletic reports some of these rumors as rumors, but, but still incredibly heinous stuff. And then you get the actual story, and it was 15 women uh, that accused the, I guess, the staff or people that worked for the team of sexual assault, but they... But that's all it was. It didn't. It wasn't any story about Jay Gruden. It wasn't any story about uh, Dan, Dan Snyder, Snyder specifically. It, it. This is why you have to get the story correct, which I guess is why it took so long to actually put this out. It, give me, give me some thoughts here on on just how careful the media needs to be with things like this, so that it doesn't go bananas. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. And you know, I work for an NFL team and. Uh, and the Redskins obviously are under fire, and rightfully so, for what seems to be a culture of sexual harassment in the day and age that we're in. This stuff can't be going on. But to read that stuff on on Wednesday night and on Thursday before the report came out, with so many of the Washington media 
uh, that, that in a lot of ways uh, are being exposed now as not really journalists, but more or less bloggers in the basement, that old cliche, putting my sources are telling me or here's what I'm hearing and putting things like uh, sexual assault and connections to Jeffrey Epstein, uh, the now deceased uh, individual embroiled in, in a sex trafficking controversy. I mean, there were there were media members repeating and retweeting things about sex trafficking, about drug parties. To have all of that just be completely fabricated, made up, it, it, amen, on whatever happened to some form of journalism, editorial restraint, because obviously the Washington Post wasn't working on any of those things, guys. And Chris, I know you feel strongly about the same thing. Yeah, no, that's my biggest issue is is what was reported is a terrible thing. Nobody's downplaying that. I've, I mean, I've listened to so many people say, if you think this isn't a big deal, then you're a part of the problem. The problem is, is we were hit in the face with a rumor that was an atom bomb and we got shot in the chest with a 22. Like, yeah, they're both really bad. But yeah. what you hit me with was just damning. I don't know any other word to say damning to Dan Snyder personally. And and this was, you know, maybe he was involved in some of this. Maybe he told the guys that, you know, some of this stuff was allowed. And and we don't even really have good information on that. But we, now we got a bunch of maybes he knew this was happening and did nothing as opposed to he was holding girls' passports hostage, you know, it, unless they slept with him or other members of the whatever. That That's a completely different story. So Well, and it's, and it's also something that's actionable if, if he were to want to retaliate, not likely, but it's actionable in other ways too. He's a better man uh, than me. From the civil courts and those, and those kind of things. I, but I don't um, care that he doesn't need the money. I would I would right. want to put those people who said those rumors out of business. I've got better well, lawyers. Yeah, I've got better I've got accountable deeper, at the yeah. very minimum. I would own I would own the athletic right now. I would I would Well, and so uh, and it's interesting that one of their reporters is making the accusations and I agree completely with you as, as a father of two uh, 12 year old daughters, you start to change your, your perspective. And Gary, you've got a daughter as well. And Chris, I yeah. can't remember if you got daughters, but yep. anybody that's out there, you, you want your, your young ladies to grow up and, and to go on into a workforce where if they're experiencing this, they are believed. Yes. They, they are taken at their word. And this stuff is, here's that word again, acted upon. It's actionable. That, uh, and what became of the Redskins culture, and we've heard this now several times in several other situations was the almost resignation of we can't complain because it's going to fall on deaf ears. We're, we're going to maybe even get retaliated against, but at the minimum, we're wasting our time. They're not going to do anything, and they're going to basically uh, come back at us with, if you don't want this job, there are, five, what did the article say, a thousand others who will take the job instead yep. if you want to keep complaining. So that, that culture needs to be gone now that we're into the 2020s. Uh, here that that idea and one more point because the talk has been in the last day or two what at what level is this going to rise to clearly Donald Sterling lost control of the LA Clippers for his behavior but a lot of that guys was him being on tape saying these things himself even racist things uh, and, a, and a girlfriend and a strange girlfriend got him on tape and it, it basically uh, it cost him his ownership. They, they ran him out on a rail. Jerry Richardson, the owner of the Carolina Panthers, same thing, almost with a culture, not, not on tape, but almost with the culture of sexual harassment, his lewd comments, his own comments as the owner, uh, and what became well-known almost around the office, and nobody did anything about it because he was the owner of the team, it ran him out as the owner of the Panthers, is my point, and they did that fairly quickly back about a year and a half ago. So that's the next thing. What happens with Dan Snyder and the ownership? It's a great debate. Yeah. Uh, here's the other side of the, the journalistic part of this. How often nowadays do we actually see a story of 15 separate cases where one of them has not been brought up on Twitter before? Like, it, I understand what we were talking about before with, you know, if, if you don't want this job, then a thousand other people want it, and et cetera, et cetera. So people are scared to talk. But how yep. in the world do you coordinate 15 formerly unknown assault accusations all in one spot to release into one story? 
Like, it, that is absolutely mind-blowing to me well, that they were able to keep this under wraps. What typically will happen in these situations is you talk, and I know this from a ju- people a that do investigative reporting. Digging. Yeah. Well, right, and, and I know this from people that do this for a living, and you guys have seen this and, and may even know some people who do this too. So you start to dig, you talk to a couple of people, and then those people begin to, with your trust to open up to you and say, talk to her and talk to her and talk to her. And then some of them will talk to you, and some of them won't talk to you. But especially if it's an anonymous situation, you, you, may, get, uh, you, you may get a half dozen or ten of them that you didn't know existed once you begin to talk. And if they are able to tell you specific stories that are verifiable – uh, I mean, let's bring it to what we do. So we're on the air. We're in the media. We're broadcasting. I've known Larry Michael for, for more than 20-plus years, who's been the voice of the Washington Redskins. So what is being alleged is that he he was part of this culture of making comments with younger female employees and interns, and he even did this in the presence of other uh, employers, other other employers of the interns and those kind of things, and nothing was being done. And they actually had a videotape of him on an online segment that he was going to do, making one of those comments, and they took it to HR to deal with it, and supposedly nothing was done. This was done at least back during the football season, if not well before that, and nothing was done. Now, the Redskins say that that tape still exists, that they did not delete it, but the allegation is they buried that or deleted the tape, and this is part of the culture. And lo and behold, when the allegations came forward the last couple of days, Larry Michael suddenly resigns, and he's been the voice of the Redskins for like 15 years on the radio, and and their uh, highest-level broadcasting guy that they have with their team. So it just gives you an idea of what you are up against. If you're making the accusations here, they would have theoretically had somebody on tape doing the sexual harassment and they buried it. And that's, and that's what these women are saying privately, why you don't come forward. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We, we actually just saw a, a Yahoo story come across that. I mean, this is another pretty damning thing about, uh, but this one actually does have to do with Jay Gruden. Um, Chris, I mean, you want to, I mean, so DJ Swearinger just, just shared this out on Instagram. Um, and Yahoo just wrote this story about it. It's basically a text message thread between him and Jay Gruden, where Jay Gruden is kind of threatening to, to fight DJ Swearinger. It seems to be over, over a loss and I guess bad play. Um, yeah, here, here's what the, here's what the text says. It says, uh, want to play? Let's F and play. DJ said, who's this? The guy said, call me back. DJ said, I don't know who this is. And he said, Jay Gruden, I'm waiting. And he said, uh, we can face-to-face, man-to-man, tomorrow or tonight if you'd like. And what you mean, want to play? So Jay said, where you want to meet, we can meet tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> and he said, so DJ said, we'll let cooler heads prevail tomorrow at 10 a.m. So Jay said, done. And basically, you know, DJ said, I'm tired of this, and I lost respect for the staff and the head coach. Uh, he wanted me to act out, but I handled it professionally. Um, I mean, it was just, it, he, he said he wants to call everybody out. They all need to be exposed. He said, I have a daughter to raise. Uh, I mean, this stuff, like, it, it, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is, some of this stuff is absolutely banana. <laughs> well, and, and I can give you a little bit of insight because obviously I was around the Grudens a bunch. I've known Jay Gruden for going on 25 years since his arena football days in Tampa with the Tampa Bay Storm Arena football team, and now he's gone on to his coaching career. I obviously worked with his older brother, John, uh, here in my in my roles here, and I have, I have much love and respect. They always treated me well in a lot of different situations and circles. I will say I haven't really had much contact with Jay Gruden for the better part of probably seven or eight years, 10 years now, something like that. And, and obviously he rose to the head coaching level um, and, and was with the Redskins and even got them into the playoffs with Kirk Cousins one year. But then it became a downward spiral for him as the coach over the last couple of years, and they fired him during the season last year. So my point is it doesn't surprise me that some knives would come out against him and and how he handled things. And we'll wait to see what else uh, that comes of this because, again, 
to have to have watched all of that on Wednesday night and Thursday with the uh, you know I'm hearing my sources say to me all these different things. You would hope there was something besides just the sexual harassment claims when Jay Gruden's name was being bantied about over and over again. And I know DJ Swearinger uh, a little bit, uh, the defensive back, because he played in Tampa Bay and he's bounced around with, with several different teams. And so it's interesting what his motivation would be on speaking out on this now and publicizing it now. So the knives are coming out a little bit on Jay Gruden. Well, I will say this. Uh, DJ did come out. that It was after a loss, and DJ told the media – uh, for sure that, hey, you can't blame this on the players because we're the same guys that have been here and, and we used to win. Like he said, we're still working hard. We're still So he was calling out the coaches in the press conference. And, and Jay, of course, getting a little, well, a little remember, irritated. Remember, Jay had stepped in it before that because oh, it, yeah. it really became a divisive thing. And Jay began to call out the players in the media, which is always a dangerous thing about this one doesn't know what he's doing. Ask him. That one doesn't know what he's doing. He's not going to be here. When you start doing that, you set yourself up for what you're hinting at there, that the players are going to fight back and, and say, you know, maybe it is the coaches. <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> maybe you are the reason we're losing. Let's uh, Let's stay on the NFL. Let's move into this upcoming season. We'll, we'll get to maybe some positive news, I guess. Uh, look, J.J. Watt came out yesterday and put in words exactly what we're trying to figure out here, whether or not they're ready for training camp. I mean, training camp starts on the 28th. We are 11 days away from that, and we don't know if they're going to be ready because we keep seeing arguments between the NFL PA and the NFL actual league. Here's what J.J. Watt put. I'm just going to go on and read the whole thing. It's not super long. He said, here's what we know and what we don't know. One, we want to play. Two, we want to be as safe as possible. Three, we have not received a single valid infections, disease, emergency response from any team or the league. Four, we don't know if there are preseason games or not. Five, we don't know if there will be daily testing, semi-daily testing, etc. Six, we don't know how a potential positive COVID test would affect contracts roster spots, et cetera. Seven, nothing has been agreed upon regarding what training camp will actually look like and how the ramp-up period will work. And then eight, we want to play. He said we <laughs> want to play twice. Um, but this is this is interesting that the teams themselves have not, or, or the league, has not given full information on exactly what is going to happen here. Give me... Give me some insight here. I mean, what what are we looking forward to? I mean, I, I wish I had great insight. You said it best. We don't know. One one thing that I keep coming back to, in a lot of facets of what we're dealing with with the COVID nineteen pandemic, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know how much longer it's going to last. We don't know when there's a vaccine. We don't know how we handle kids going back to school. That's still being meted out. And obviously, at this point, the NFL and the NFLPA don't know. But the clock continues to tick, um, and there, there are there, there are some weeks to play with here. I, I mean, people keep asking me in my market, uh, Gary and Chris, are we going to have preseason games? I don't have that answer. I, I keep joking with everybody. The Glazer family that owns the Bucks, they don't consult with me. We don't have breakfast. We don't go over this over uh, over donuts <laughs> uh, over whether they're going to have preseason games. But but certainly, if you are going to have games in August, you've got to start moving forward with the plan, getting the players back in the building to be able to practice together, things like that, before you can ever talk about playing. So here we sit now on July 17th, and we don't know, and that, that post by J.J. Watt that went out to everybody indicates that the players themselves and the Players Association doesn't know and wants to know. Yeah, I, Matt Miller jumped in on YouTube. He said, are these leagues this stupid, especially the NFL, where they've had months to prepare and have come up with no protocols? I don't believe that they don't have any protocols. My thought process is they're going to wait until the players get there and then walk everybody through all of this. I don't know that these protocols need to be released to the public. Like maybe I'm crazy for that. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I was I was I was thinking the same thing Matt Miller was thinking too. Was why haven't they just put together a plan? Like even even one thing we know that has to happen right now is everybody has to be flexible. During this time, going through what we're going through, flexibility is the most valuable thing anybody can bring to the table. Yeah. So, if you put together a plan, I'm not going to hold a gun to your head and say, you have a plan, we're sticking this plan, we can't diverge from the plan. But I am saying, you have to have some sort of a plan. 
and and you need to let the players know. I mean, that's the biggest part of this is I don't know that they're going to come back to work until they know what's going on. But so not telling them until they get there is is irresponsible. You have to tell the NFLPA because the NFLPA has to sign off on the plan. Yeah. So it's not like you can just say come into work and then I'll tell hey, you. Can I add one other thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. You got to be ready that you're going to have people test positive. We're yeah. seeing it already across the board. Well, we've, had, sports, we've had 72. The NFL. Yeah, it's 72 and so in the NFL. Then, as part of the plan, what are you doing when players test positive here in the training camp situation? What are you doing if players test positive the week of games, preseason or the regular season? How are you handling that? Clearly, that's not been resolved, or J.J. Watt isn't putting that on social media, that it's been, it's been resolved as of yet. There's still time to get it resolved and get it resolved over the next few weeks before we head to September and October and start trying to play games that matter, games uh, for real. I mean, one other thing, you didn't ask me specifically about this, but to skip back to college football, you know, everybody has begun to question whether there are going to be games because the Ivy League uh, announced earlier this week we're not playing any sports at all this fall, including football. Okay, that's, that's their decision. We understand that. But for anybody that has any understanding of how college football works to think that the SEC or the Big Ten in specific and the ACC right behind them, but the SEC and the Big Ten in specific are not going to play because the Ivy League says they're not going to play, that's like saying that uh, you're, you're McDonald's and Burger King and you're not serving hamburgers anymore because Joe's Hamburger Stand says they don't want to serve hamburgers anymore. Not the same thing <laughs> as, the, uh, as the SEC and the Big Ten. And why are you canceling if you're the SEC or the Big Ten in July for the season? You have time to still wait, figure it out, if you can figure it out. And then if you have to make a decision in late August or September, we can't play right now, we have to postpone, okay. But I, I don't know what the rush is to cancel in, in, uh, in July. And the NFL is not going to be the same way. The, the, the NFL is going to take its time here over the next two, three weeks or longer to figure out how and when we can play, guys. Yeah, no, I've been screaming that from the rooftops for the last couple of weeks. Good. Listen, just, just because, let's say the outcome is the exact same. Let's say that the SEC and the Big Ten decide we're not going to play football. I assure you, what the Ivy League did had zero factor in that. <laughs> I mean, it was a nothing burger. But the problem is, is everybody attributes the Ivy League to shutting down basketball because the Ivy League said, we're not playing in the NCAA tournament anymore, and we're shutting basketball down early. And then the next thing you know, the NCAA tournament shut down. But it didn't right. shut down because of the Ivy League. It shut down because of, of the NBA and, and, exactly and what right. happened there. Rudy all Gobert, sp- Yeah, Rudy Gobert. There all yep. sports shut down that day. That, the Ivy League had nothing nothing to do with that yeah and we understand and so the fans understand uh i think for the most part but it bears repeating there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars at stake for the sec and the big 10 and the acc in specific to play football uh and and the lifeblood of the student athletes the everybody associated with all the athletic programs that gets paid is the college football season. So before you just bring the curtain down figuratively on all of that, you got to be ready for the ramifications of not playing at all. And again, the, the Ivy League doesn't make money off of athletics. The Ivy League has hundreds of millions of dollars flowing through all of those schools through donations, through all of the, uh, all of the people that sponsor everything that they're doing. They, they don't care about athletics making them any money. It's entirely different in the, in the worlds of the SEC and the Big Ten in specific. So let's see if they can get it figured out, boys. Well, here, here's the thing that matters is we have to stop being so afraid of positive tests. Like, so many people didn't – they had this thing. They didn't know they had it. And then Correct. we encouraged them to go out and get tested. They got tested. They tested positive. But nothing in their life from the three days before they took the test and the three days after they took the test changed. They, they, they are asymptomatic. We have to stop being scared of positive tests, yep. and we have to start looking at hospitalizations, people who are actually getting sick, and we need to make sure we're taking care of those people. I'm not saying don't wear masks. I'm not saying not, don't take this thing seriously, but what I'm saying is, is yes, 72 NFL players tested positive. 30-something people at LSU tested positive. Zero of them are sick. 
all of the sports people between basketball, baseball, football, the NBA, all of the college football players. We got over 10,000 people that tested positive in all of these things or have been tested in all of these sports. Just in sports, one person has any sick symptoms whatsoever. That was Freddie Freeman, and it was mild sickness. That was it. Everybody else that tested positive, no symptoms whatsoever. Nothing in their life has changed. And they didn't get it from playing sports because sports weren't going on at that time. So to play sports because you might get it isn't going to help the problem because you might get it anywhere. That's true, too. And I'm with you. We, we need to be wearing masks. We need to be socially distanced. We need to be smart about what we're doing. But this is not a healthy person's problem no. either. It's exactly what you're saying. And so you're talking about the healthiest It is a problem to the extent that if you get it and you have the symptoms, like, for example, I've got a colleague, a friend in Los Angeles, and she and her family in the media, she and her family have this, and she's been putting it on social media so I can say her name. Lisa Horn is her name. Lisa's family didn't have any idea that they had this, and they've been socially distancing with masks. They've been away from everybody, and suddenly one of the daughters wasn't feeling well, and the next thing you knew, the father, these are are college-age daughters, the father, the college age daughters, they all started experiencing the symptoms. They've been dealing with that. What she was reporting, I'm not speaking for her, is they've gone through the worst of it and they are feeling better now. And so, you know, that's the hope across the country that even if you do get this and experience symptoms, you're going to feel better. Sure, there are going to be some who get seriously ill. Unfortunately, horribly, especially if you're older, there, there are deaths involved with this. But I have said this consistently, and I hear you saying it in your voice as well, Chris, for the last four months. Unless unless we are all going to collectively just stay inside with the doors closed and nobody associates with anybody until there's a vaccine, which could be in 2021 or 2022, we have to move on with how do we deal with this and still function. And part of that is be ready to test positive, and you may even get sick from this. But there's a 99.999% chance if you are younger and healthy that you're going to be fine in a matter of days and overcome it. We need to continue to articulate all of those things while we make these decisions. Yep. Now, you are definitely right. All right, so let's go on and close out the show with this. We're going to move into college football, and, mm. and this does have to do with uh, with some of the COVID stuff and whatnot. Uh, but really, it's it's discussing hypotheticals and ideas that the SEC, among other leagues, are looking into. And, you know, we just talked about the Ivy League. We just talked about, you know, whether or not those decisions would affect what the SEC and these other conferences do. We know that the Big Ten has already said that they are doing conference only along with the Pac-12. We understand what they are doing. The Pac-12 more than likely going to delay the start, uh, and we'll see what happens with that. Ross Dellinger and Pat Forty from SI.com came out and they got information from the SEC meeting that was held on Monday and they discussed basically the second week of the season is September 12th. Um, The SEC, ACC, and Big 12 are scheduled to hold something similar to uh, Major League Baseball's interleague play. LSU's playing Texas, Tennessee plays Oklahoma, Auburn meets North Carolina, Mississippi State traveling to NC State, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the ACC-SEC rivalry games at the end of the season with Florida State, Florida, Kentucky, Louisville, South Carolina, Clemson, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you've got all of these. These conferences do not want to give up the rivalry games or these big non-conference matchups for whatever reason. Uh, There are multiple options that they can go with. The most prevalent one that everybody seems to be a fan of is eight conference games and two non-conference games. That's what they're pushing towards. Is this a good idea? Chris, I'm going to start with you first, and then we'll go with you, TJ. So I think this is moronic. I don't understand why they are so set on these rivalry games mattering this year. If I was the home team of the rivalry game, my school, LSU, is going to face this. We had to get on a plane. We had to go to Austin, Texas. We had to sit amongst 100,000 screaming Texas fans last year and whip their butt. Okay, now they're going to get to come to Baton Rouge and and play in front of an empty stadium. That, that's not a home and home trade off. Why can we not <laughs> punt this game to next year? Why can we right. not punt it to another time? Same thing if you're Florida, Florida State. If last year, if the, if the Gators had to go to Florida State and play, 
And then now they get a home game against Florida State in an empty stadium. And then next year they get to go. That's that's not a trade-off that anybody wants. I don't understand why we can't pause a rivalry season, a rivalry game for one season, just because we can just say, look, it, it, it's we're going through a pandemic and we just want to get a season out. I, I just don't understand the logical arguments for why. And how these do you do it? And to follow matter. to follow up on that, how do you do it where you have a fair number of games across the board? Yeah. Because again, you, like you mentioned, I'm in Florida. That Florida Florida State rivalry is as heated as any other rivalry. They want to play each other, but it's not a conference game. The Auburn Alabama game is a conference game. You guys know this. Yeah. The Division Michigan game. Ohio State game is a conference game. The Texas Oklahoma game is a conference game. So if you're trying to have everybody plays the same number of games. Now you're going to have a bunch of schools in the SEC and the Big Ten going, okay, well, who is that other game against? And then you would have an argument about exactly what you're talking about, the power ranking of the team you're playing. We're playing where where there are no fans, maybe. Uh, If it's the backside of a home-and-home like LSU and Texas or some of these other matchups, I I totally understand and and totally get it. So I I don't know if the rivalry games survive. I I do know in, in uh, in the state of Florida, they want Florida and Florida State to play each other. Clemson and South Carolina, they want them to play each other in that state it's just different for them than what it is for the ones that have the rivalry games within their conference i could i could understand uh, a scenario not saying they will do this where you say okay we're going to play the nine games in a row in our league or the eight games in a row in our league and then the final week is where we can play these rivalry games so uh, these, and, these are, and that'll be the ninth game or the tenth game. I yeah. don't know that everybody goes along with that, though, guys. Here we but, go again with the what ifs. I don't know that everybody agrees with that. These are the the models that have emerged. So there's that eight and two that I just talked about. The other option is an eight game conference only schedule. The other one is a nine or ten game plan that would preserve at least one scheduled matchup with a Power Five conference program. These are. I, but where I, do you play that? Do you play that, if I can interject, do you play that at the end of the year? Or like you were talking about, do you play that in, in the early part of the year? And uh, I, I think that you got to have that out on the forefront of where do you play that other game or those other two games? Are they coming at the end? Are they coming in the middle? That's a big question mark. Uh, Will Gomez jumped in on Periscope. He said, don't be surprised if the SEC is playing in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Connecticut to avoid the hot spots. No, it's it's going to happen down here. Uh, and then Michael said, if they're set on keeping them, why not pick a neutral site? Uh, Colorado, Colorado State play in Mile High. Yeah, Correct. I mean you could you could certainly do that. Um, and that's two of them that are not in the same conference to make the analogy. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. Correct. So uh, the, the way that I would look at it, and from everything that I have seen, they are determined to get in these conference championship games. So more than likely, you're going to start with a full division slate. I would think you would want, those yeah. would be the most important games. So yeah. those would be the important right. ones, and then you move the rivalries and the non-conference games and whatever to the end of the season because you can you can just kind of punt those. I think that we're going to move into an incredibly flexible schedule uh, because they're going to set it up where, okay, well, if you can't play this week, then we're going to bump you to the next week, and this is going to be your <laughs> opponent, and the schedule is going to be haywire. I mean, it's going to be. I but will because say this, of, this is it'll why, be entertaining. But this is why the conferences. If I'm the commissioner of one of these conferences, I want to control that chaos. Yes. I don't want to care about what's happening in the ACC, and I don't want to care what's happening in the Big Twelve. I only care about my 14 teams. And if I have a school that for some reason can't play a game, and I've got another school sitting there ready to play this game, I want to be able to grab one of my bye week schools and says, "In two weeks, you're playing this team." Yeah, because we're filling this thing up, and and everybody's got two weeks notice before they play somebody new, so you never have to have a have a last minute game. But but that's just the way we would do it. I want to have that control. I want to be able to tell this school you're doing this and you're doing that, and you can't walk into the Big Twelve and say, "Hey, who you got available? I've got an open spot." DJ, what do you think? What? A lot of unknowns. Uh, again, the <laughs> SEC, the SEC has by far the most lucrative deals, including that CBS deal, to play their games, and so they're going to probably be the forerunner here. On uh, we're just going to play our own because you bring up a great point. 
But if, if you want to play that SEC championship game, all right, so now you've played your eight or your nine league games, are you now saying that that other game, like it is for Florida, Florida State, like it is for Clemson and South Carolina, is the last game before Georgia, Georgia Tech, the last game before that conference championship game, theoretically? That's where the other game goes? Because a lot of years, teams take that week off, schools take that week off if they're not playing the rivalry game. A lot of the rank and file of the SEC might be playing another SEC opponent that week instead of playing a rivalry game in yeah. the schedules. So how do you work that? Because, again, if you're Alabama, if you're LSU, if you're Florida, the, the perennial teams, Georgia right now that are contending, Auburn, uh, you know, Auburn, go, you, you go play the Iron Bowl. Now we got to be contemplating whether we're playing Oklahoma State or whether we're playing whoever <laughs> exactly. instead of, instead of uh, having an off week or having an easy team before the SEC championship game. That, again, I don't know if that flies with everybody on how you work that out with an extra game at the end before a championship game. I, I think we're all on the same page. It, the best, easiest way to get this season in would be to move to conference only. Yeah, I just don't understand the reason why – those three conferences are so enamored with this. We have to do it this way. They're married to these rivalries. We're not asking for the next day. Are they afraid that if we don't play it once, then we can't get those games again? Like, they'll just stop playing us? That's not going to happen. <laughs> no, it, it'll definitely not happen. It's. I would. I, this is yeah. just one of those seasons where flexibility is the most important thing. I want control. Uh, Michael, I Michael want said this control. on Twitch. He said these programs need to understand that this year is effed. Let's just get the games and be thankful for it. That's right. That's right. That's I just I want control, and I'm with Gary. The divisional games have to be played first. If you have a cross rival with another conference team, that needs to be the very next game. Auburn, Georgia have been playing for over a hundred years. That that needs to be a game that plays week you know week seven. Yeah, it needs to happen immediately, like as quick as we can. Yes, you are correct, TJ. Uh, before we wrap things up, go ahead and tell us about uh, about your boys, Jock uh, Jock Market. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you for the plug. Uh, by the way, I always love getting a chance to mix it up with you guys. And I got to get one or both of you back on the Three Dog Thursday podcast. So uh, the Three Dog Thursday podcast, interestingly enough, came out again on Thursday. It's out route right now. You can find it wherever you find podcasts, uh, find the YouTube. And we've got a new sponsor. Uh, and I did an interview uh, with their chief marketing officer uh, for Jock Market. This is fascinating. You guys will love this with the resumption of the NBA coming up. This is the stock market of sports for individual players. Buy and, and sell individual players while the games are going on. And according to how savvy you are with buying and selling and projecting uh, in real time, you can score big time through Jock Market. You can go get the app for free. The game is free when the NBA starts up. It's Jock Market. They're online at Jock MKT for Market. Jock MKT dot com in the Apple Store right now. Soon to be in the Google Play Store. Go get the Jock Market app. And again, it, it's really cool because you go into a single day of NBA play like Daily Fantasy. You use your jock market chips to go get players, guys. And then if LeBron, let's say, is having a bad first quarter in the Lakers game and you have other players you want to try to trade for, you want to dump LeBron because his value's gone down in the first quarter, you can dump LeBron and go pick up whomever, Kawhi Leonard, Giannis, or somebody else. You buy and sell and trade players just like the stock market as long as the games are going on. So you're not locked in like Daily Fantasy. So that's one of the advantages of Jock Market. A lot of fun, innovative, live trading during the games. They've got NBA contests that are going to be ready to go when the regular season games, much less the playoff games, start up. So, again, go find them at Jock Market. They're a sponsor with me. You're gracious to let me talk about them with you. I know that we're, we're going to have a little relationship real quick with uh, winning cures in Jock Market here in the next couple of weeks for the restart of the NBA. So they are very excited. Uh, you get in the game uh, very easily. Take you less than a couple of minutes to get the app, sign up, and be in the game for their contest for the NBA. So buy and sell players while the games are going on for the NBA. It's fascinating. Uh, you know, uh, you know that board. we are Grizzlies fans, and, and we are getting basketball here in the next two weeks. So we're pretty fired up. We want to see John ja Morant. I'm going to so, see what, so uh, what his stock looks like. So hypothetically, like John ja Morant, before the games began, might be $10 a share. He starts going off in the first quarter, which you want him to do. 
Well, now suddenly if you want him, he's $16 a chip or a share, or he's $18 a share if you want to buy him, but you got him at 10 so you're in much better shape. And, again, all of this is kept in real time, buy and trade players. Somebody's having a great first half. Somebody's having a great quarter. You can go buy them or you can trade them or you can hold on to them. So jock market and let's see what the Grizzlies can do battling against the uh, the Hornets and – or uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the Pelicans and the – the Kings, uh, Kings and the Spurs and the, and the Blazers. And yeah. Yep, yep. All that good stuff. All right. So let's go on and wrap up the show. Go over to winningcureseverything.com. That's our, our website. Picks, previews, podcasts, videos, social media platforms, etc. You can go over to sportsbookreview.com. That is where all of our college football content will be once we start into August. And you can follow TJ over on Twitter at BuckSidelineGuy. You can get the Three Dog Thursday podcast anywhere that you get your podcasts. Go leave him a nice five-star review. Tell him that we sent you. He will appreciate that. Michael says, uh, to close this out, thanks as usual, fellas. One more week closer to football, I hope. Have a safe weekend and gig them. That's, uh, that's our Denver Broncos uh, season <laughs> ticket holder. So, uh, with that said, TJ, thank you so much for hopping in, and, uh, and we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Boys, great to be with you as always. Thank you, Winning Cures Dudes. Much Absolutely. Luck, have a great weekend. Hey, you too. You too. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.